drew the short straw and I'm first. So. <laughs> so I'm Edison. I'm a science teacher by choice, Londoner by sheer luck. Both my parents had escaped war-torn countries. Um, and so I grew up with a very strong sense of just how lucky I was to be born in a country like Britain. I kid you not, every Christmas without fail would still be made forced to watch the Queen's speech at Christmas every, every year, yeah. without fail, standing up. And, uh, and so you could suffice to say that I was very proud to be British. However, I remember the exact moment when my identity was questioned. I had taken the train up to Newcastle to see some friends. I was walking out the train station when suddenly I hear some loud voices from across the street. Ching Chong Chang. I was perplexed. Were they talking to me? Confusion quickly turned to anger as I realized that I was the only person that they could possibly be talking about. And I told them forcefully to F off. The teenage boys laughed and carried on walking down the street. I told myself that night that kids were kids, let it go. But I remember that it impacted me greatly. Um, here I was, a grown man in my 20s, being subject to racist abuse and in my own country, I don't know how many people in this room have ever experienced racism in their own country. But I can tell you that that moment profoundly changed me. For the first time, I felt like I didn't quite belong. A bit like a odd puzzle piece that didn't quite fit in with the rest of the big picture. And I compared this feeling with how I felt when I was living in China during my gap year. Suffice to say, I blended in. Um, granted, only if I kept my mouth firmly shut. Um, but in all seriousness, I remember feeling a deep sense of connection. A connection to my ancestry, which stretched back thousands of years in one of the world's oldest civilizations. And I also remember feeling free free from needing to justify or prove why I was there, to explain why I should be there, why I should belong. When I became a teacher, such issues of belonging and identity continued to occupy my mind. Every day I would walk into class and see British Nigerians, British Polish, British Bangladeshis, students of mine, all working together on the same experiment. But come lunchtime, I would walk out across the playground and see the same racial and cultural groups forming once again. One group playing footy over here, another group playing over there. These issues of, and, and thoughts of division continue to get my mind thinking um, on a much more personal level. I call this my dilemma of belonging. But you know what? Kids growing up today shouldn't have to face this dilemma of belonging. And they don't need to face it if everyone is prepared to deal with the reality of our globalized world. In Canada, as in every other country, your kids, my future kids, they are going to meet people from different cultural backgrounds. And differences are gonna be more visible than ever before. For me, that old hallmark of successful integration, that of tolerance, it just won't be good enough anymore. That is why over the last few years, I've devoted myself to researching and studying and working towards a more culturally responsive education. One that will give students, young people, the tools to navigate the modern pluralism that is our world. 
to those boys in Newcastle and all, to all young people. I want them to understand how complex identities are emerging in our modern world. But more than that, I want them to engage in those differences, not ignore them or use them to exclude other people. At, its very, at the very least, culturally responsive education can serve to counter the narrow identity politics that we see right now from Marie Le Pen in France to Trump in America. And at its very best, education can be the means to create a, an inclusive society, an inclusive sense of national belonging, one that isn't skin deep, and one that allows me to be both British and Chinese. Through better education, we can ensure that all students, all young people, all citizens can feel participated, can participate fully in society, but also take that beyond to the future as well. Thank you. Namaste, everyone. My name is Brijlal. I come from a very small Tharu village. Tharus are the indigenous people of southern Nepal. I grew up with my grandfather, who was a community leader. He was nominated to represent his people at the royal court as a district chief. But guess what? He couldn't make it because he couldn't speak Nepali. He took this as a failure and humili humiliating. He responded by sending all his kids and his grandchildren to formal school. <coughs> he used to tell me, until the lion <coughs> knows how to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. With this, I left home when I was 10. I went to a national boarding school in Kathmandu that is 13 hours away by bus. <laughs> but if you fly, it's only 15 minutes. <laughs> After Kathmandu and United World College in Norway and Hong Kong, I did my BA in the US and returned home. I lead an NGO with 75 staff members and a farmer's cooperative. I have managed to grow tall like a tree and bear fruits, but I'm not sure how strongly my roots hold me on the ground. The education that I received helped me converge with the rest of the world. But it took me away from my own family. I simply missed the opportunity to grow with my family and learn the indigenous traditions and knowledge. I wish my grandfather was around who could teach me how to predict the rain or build windows without any nails. <clears throat> I feel like I'm swimming between the two river banks, sometimes with the current and sometimes against it. We all want to be global, rich and successful. I wanted it too. However, we need to ask ourselves, are we losing ourselves in this process? The whole world is racing towards the materialistic success in the name of development and civilization. To achieve this supreme goal, we're rushing towards the mecca of knowledge, our educational institutions. However, the supreme knowledge and history that we are taught are drifting us away 
from other ways of learning and living. Such institutions are producing a dominant monolithic culture. As a result, the indigenous communities in Nepal, Tanzania, New Zealand, you name it, Canada, around the world, are buried and struggling to thrive, even sprout. We need to gauge deep into, the, into these ind indigenous communities that are constantly being isolated and marginalized. As we have been imposing our dominant culture over them. Indigenous culture and communities around the world are at the stage of extinction that holds tremendous amount of knowledge and stories and history that could elevate our, our humanity further. Sadly, such knowledge and history are not in our curriculum and we seldom learn about them. It is very timely to preserve such knowledge and stories. And we can start from today as we walk out of this room. There is an urgency to in incorporate such knowledge and stories in the curriculum that our children will learn such actions will dignify and glorify the indigenous, indigenous cult communities around the world and allow them to take pride in who, in who they are. Dhanyavad. migration and identity. I felt stuck. I'm from Yellowknife. In Canada, this arouses mild to moderate interest. Everywhere else, it gets blank stares. It's a novelty, somewhere isolated and notoriously cold, but not somewhere people think about on a regular basis. Except for me. I think about it every day. I grew up there. My family is there. It's home. Perhaps I felt stuck because I realized that while my roots are in the North, I haven't lived there for five years. I'm not totally sure yet how the newer parts of my self-concept fit in with that foundation and how that fits in with the work that I believe in. My parents moved North when they were young, seeking adventure and good jobs. First in Iqaluit, then in Yellowknife, they, and later we, took to the Northern lifestyle. We spent time on the land, we whistled at the Northern Lights, we participated in traditional Northern and Indigenous activities, we perfected the art of making Halloween costumes that fit over snowsuits. As I developed my wings and left the nest to travel and live around the world, I've built on my lifelong identity project with bits and pieces of the different lives I've lived. Here in Montreal, I've fallen in love with the interculturalism, the joie de vivre, the food, the poutine, the men, the poutine, <laughs> but still my northern roots remain. It's because of these roots that I care about the things that I care about. My desire to advocate for gender equity and a fairer world stem from thing the things I lived and witnessed growing up in Yellowknife. Things like volunteering to raise money for desperately needed and under-resourced Northern women's shelters. Things like witnessing the impacts of colonialism on Indigenous women and men, and the internal conflict of being a living part of that legacy. But as my identity has grown, so has the scope of my interests. When backpacking in international hostels, I've encountered vastly different cultural views towards gender rights. When living in Zanzibar, I realize that international development often leads to deepening rifts on issues around equal rights for women and girls. And now, as I navigate Quebec's infamous healthcare system, I grow more and more convinced of the need 
for wide-scale systems change in women's healthcare in Canada. <gasps> These experiences build on each other. They create a broader perspective that remains rooted in the desire for a more equal world. Today, our cities are full of people from all over. Who in this room doesn't have roots, formative experiences, or loved ones elsewhere? So many of us have been uprooted from our singular place-based identities. We build and rebuild new ones from bits and pieces of other countries, cultures, and experiences. What does it mean to no longer be one of an us in opposition to them? To be part of many us's. And what does that mean for the advocacy issues around which we build our lives? The new world requires that we reframe identity. We must acknowledge that identity is never monolithic. It is always fluid and always intersectional. Creating and embracing a modern concept of identity is the prerequisite for real contemporary social change. As for me, my sense of self has grown to include a family of urban, transnational, and international compatriots. I've become who I am through the experiences I've had with them, inside the Sauvé house and out. For me, it's only been natural that the scope of my interests has grown in the same way. I've had to reconcile my commitment to local level change with my desire to work on a broader scale that takes into account the person I am today. As I make Montreal my home, my advocacy, like my identity, draws from different places, experiences, and cultures. Transitioning into a new field, working on gender-focused health improvements in Canada, I reframe my own identity once again, drawing from all of these past experiences, Northern, Canadian, and international. I try to allow myself to grow in new and unexpected ways, embracing both roots and wings, and creating something new in between. Thank you. In 2013, I returned to Romania from studying politics in France, and I resumed my political consultancy work. I was soon consumed by frustration Romanian politics hadn't changed, but I had. I could no longer tolerate the dirty hands politics, the old idea that serving the greater good somehow justified immoral practices. Some of my political clients did not need a political consultant. What they needed was a lawyer. Others needed a reality check, and still others needed to take a profound look in the mirror. After weeks of unease, I quit my job, and I start to look for jobs abroad. But then it struck me that I was equating success to getting out of Romania. I was about to become one of the tens of thousands of young Romanian professionals who leave the country to find better opportunities. I struggled with this idea for months. My struggle continues even now as I try to decide whether to pursue career opportunities in Romania or to start my PhD in Canada. I feel suspended between home and abroad. How can I make the most positive social change? By immersing myself in other cultures or by returning and fighting for a new way of doing politics in Romania? But Romania is my home. I love my country deeply. When I compare myself to those the system failed, I want to give back. I know the hardships of my childhood friends, those born in the rural areas of Romania. I know that with more educational opportunities, their future could have been totally different. 
50 years ago, the social elevator was still working. Today, it is stuck at the ground floor with no clear prospects of starting up again. But why should I care? There are winners and losers. Life is unfair. Maybe I should acknowledge the lost potential of some and just move forward with my life. I am ashamed that in moments of doubt, I am visited by this kind of thoughts. However, I realize that I am privileged. The mere fact that I am free to have these thoughts is because of my access to educational opportunities. This is why I want to return to Romania to apply my good education. For many, through the help of people like myself, the small step of educational access could mean the first step on the social ladder. Today, 75% of Romanians born in rural areas are not going to high school. 98% are not even thinking about going to college. Our system is failing, and we have to acknowledge this. It is failing both those in need of help, like my childhood friends. It is also failing those who have so much more to contribute, like myself and tens of thousands of young Romanian professionals. But let's not focus on who is to blame. Let's build bridges between those less and better educated, between those living inside the country and those living abroad. This is how a unique coalition for real change will become possible. This is how a country can use its diversity <clears throat> of life paths and experiences to come together and thrive. This is the Romania that I would never consider living. I, I often ask myself, how can I help really transform my unjust and unequal country? How can I remain engaged with my roots? Well, this, this, these are not only my questions, and these are not, this is not only my story. This is not only the struggle of tens of thousands of young Romanian professionals. As my survey year comes to an end, I have learned that many non-Canadian fellows are confronted with this dilemma, going home or staying abroad. In a time when extreme right-wing politicians equate immigration with low-skilled jobs, we are the other side of the coin. Our diplomas, our language skills, our multicultural outlook make us perfect migrants. However, brain drain and immigration are an existential threat to developing countries. For those in doubt about staying or remaining, I ask one thing. Before reaching a conclusion, consider assembling this coalition for change. We cannot abandon our countries, even if we decide to live abroad. If we manage to overcome our fears and we win our own battles, we can then redirect our energies into joining others' crusades. Collectively, we have an immense transformative potential. We can act, unite for our enlightened selves. We have so much more to do for so many. Thank you.
Shalom. Hello. My name is Maya, and I am Israeli. I am Israeli. For some time now, it has become increasingly difficult for me to say these three simple words. While others carry their nationality in pride, hang their flags in their rooms, and sing their national anthem in a loud voice, I whisper, I am Israeli. Every day, I open the news and watch in horror and despair how fear, racism, and hate consume my country. I see another stabbing, another death, another house demolished. I cry with the Palestinian mother who lost her child. And I jump every time my own mother texts me. I write to her, is everyone okay? Is everybody safe? How can I live in a country that occupies another people? That sees its Muslim Arab minority, 20% of its population as second class citizens. And that views African refugees that have gone through terrible atrocities and now seek asylum as a burden and a threat. To live in such a society has become increasingly intolerable to me. But I must also admit that it is no less difficult to make my home elsewhere. I grew up in Tel Aviv. It's on its beaches where I first learned how to swim, where I kissed my first boyfriend, where I rented my first apartment. It's where my family lives, where I speak Hebrew, where I eat hummus and drink arak, and laugh at my friends. Like all of you, I have no other country, nowhere else to go. My nationality, my culture, it's in my blood. It shapes the way I act, the way I think, the way I dream. So what do I do? How do I resolve this love-hate relationship I have with my country? Standing here before you in Montreal, it seems so easy to just leave my troubles far away across the ocean and start a new chapter in my life right here. It's true. I'll never feel 100% Canadian. I'll probably never learn to love the cold winters but I will be able to provide my future children a safer and better life. But still I struggle. I know that like me, 40% of young Israelis are willing to leave their homeland and start their lives elsewhere. 40%, imagine that. What will happen to my country if my generation just packs their bags, gives up, and leaves. I've had a lot of time to think about this for the last year. And while attempting to figure out very personal questions like who I am and where should I live, I realized that the solution for me and for others like me is not to renounce Israel, but rather work together to reimagine what being Israeli can mean. This is what drove me to become a social worker and an activist in the first place. The desire to create an inclusive Israel that embraces its multicultural and multi-ethnic character. A democratic country that is not based on ethnicity, but rather on a shared humanity. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. But you know what? I've not abandoned my hope. 
I see schools where Jewish, Muslim, and Christian kids play and study together. I see Palestinian and Israelis who have lost family members in this terrible conflict, marching hand in hand in nonviolent demonstrations. It is this hope, this glimpse of what my country can look like that keeps me going. And it is this optimism that ultimately drives me to return to my country. There will be good days and others not so good. And there will be times that I may question this decision. But I know deep in my heart that I do not have the privilege to look away because I am Israeli. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I was only four when the war started in Bosnia. And thinking about that and looking back then, I have to say that I don't remember much. But what I can remember are certain feelings of being loved and accepted, but also abandoned and rejected from those who should teach us opposite. Tonight, I will share some of these stories with you guys. My family was displaced internally to a town which was not affected by armed conflict. Still, although we were safe, we were not sleeping in our own beds. We were not playing on the playground that we used to know. And my parents, after 35 years of life in the same town, within the same community, suddenly had to envision a new life. By end of the war in 1995, we realized that we would never return to our homeland again. In three years, we have moved four times. Always a new bed, new playground, and a new circle of people. Finally, when we got a permanent home, I started going to school. Some teachers were very, very welcoming and friendly. Others hesitated at of having so many newcomers in the classroom. My teacher, who was a native, was not so happy of having a lot of, lot of newcomers, refugees, as she used to call us. I remember her literally ignoring us, paying attention only to the local pupils. Those pupils who had been lucky to have a new shoes, new school books, and a chance to go for a summer vacation every year. Today, every time I see my teacher, I turn my head away. I can't even say hello. My mouth gets frozen. Her example was to teach us happy and carefree children about the cruel reality that create distinctions between people, about them and us. And who knows what would happen with me if I didn't start hanging around with Nadina. Nadina was a Muslim girl, my neighbor, and my best childhood friend. As a child, I didn't know a lot about religion, skin color, gender segregation. I have to say, I spent a happy childhood playing with Nadina. While I couldn't find solace in my school and in my teacher, I found it in Adina. My parents encouraged our friendship. And while we probably didn't fully understand at the time, that taught us both about the beauty of differences, about the beauty of diversity. Our friendship was a true lesson for me. But unfortunately, not many Svetlanas have a parents like mine. In many cases, families actively discourage their children 
from spending the time with those different in color and religion. And those barriers often cause huge frustrations and serious identity crisis. Setting the stage for extremism or violent radicalism that we struggle these days. Is a, isolation is a never tool for a progressive future. Today, we see many children and many youth coming to Canada, Europe, United States, we see organizations, activists, politicians welcoming them. I want to ask the teachers and professors too, to open their hearts to those kids. It is really important for them to feel safe, loved and welcomed in the classroom. To feel finally accepted and equally engaged. For parents, sisters and brothers, who are afraid of letting their family members to play, marry, or live with people of different religion, race, or ethnicity, I have a message too. Let them interact. It makes no difference if their name is Imamu, Fatima, Abraham, or Krishna. The intermingling of cultures is one of the greatest blessings in this life. And it, it is simple. Wake up tomorrow and ask your neighbor, what can I do to make your day better? This is indeed essential to solving so much of what is wrong with our world today. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, on most days I'm an engineer, but today I won't be talking about technology. So both of my parents were born and bred in eastern Nigeria, but eventually moved to Lagos westward for economic reasons. I was born in Lagos and lived there for the first 16 years of my life. In primary school, I recall one of the first times I had to fill out a form. I put down Lagos as my state of origin. My teacher observed the discord between what I had written and my surname. She then asked me where my parents were from. I responded, Enugu State. She, she continued, Charles, Enugu is your state of origin, not Lagos. I accepted the correction and moved on. Today, however, I realized that this experience left me with concerns that I had not fully reflected over. First of all, a quick geography. Nigeria is made up of three dominant tribes. In the north, we have the Hausas. In the west, we have the Yorubas. And in the east, we have the Igbos. I'm Igbo. To put things in perspective, each of these tribes as different in culture, language, food, and clothing as France, Russia, and Ireland. Though courtesy of the British, we have a common language in English, or, or the Nigerian brand of English. The issue that bothers me is that in Nigeria, you cannot associate with your place of birth, whether legally or casually. Your state of origin is implicitly and explicitly taken to be that of your parents. Even if you've never set a foot in that land and do not know the first thing about the language. As an Igbo living in Lagos, you would get reminders from your neighbors, whether playfully or sternly, that you are not from here even if here is the only life you have ever known. When I was 17, I moved to the East for my university studies. For me, it was less about running away from Lagos than it was connecting with my roots. I wanted to deepen my knowledge of the Igbo language and culture. I wanted to perfect my speaking of the language. And, and the landscape there is just something else. So my father is from Enugu State, which means a city on a mountain. And Enugu is circled by an impressive mountain range, such that when you take a look around, you actually get the impression that nature herself built a fortress here. 
So I ended up spending the next nine years in and around Eastern Nigeria. So what is my state of origin? I'm from Enugu State, and frankly, I'm happy with that. However, I have friends who wish that Lagos, where they were born and bred, was recognized as their place of origin. These persons find themselves in a sort of cultural limbo because they don't associate the distant land to which they have been anchored, and yet are not accepted in their birthplace. Identity should be a matter of choice and not compulsion. More still, this singular separation of birth and origin has concrete far-reaching implications for the individual and community. People are deprived of basic benefits from university scholarships to jobs in the civil service to eligibility to run for state elections. And because Nigeria is a place of tribal identity politics, even when you run for federal elections, the first question asked is, what state is he from? Not, is he competent? These exclusionary policies and conduct reinforce the already thick lines of cultural divide amongst Nigerians. And this in turn serves as a repeated trigger for unending pockets of conflict and bloodshed in our country till today. The questions I ask myself now are, how can we upgrade our mindset and our state laws in acceptance of the already multicultural reality of our cities? Can we redefine Nigeria's concept of identity and how we engage with our diverse groups? This, this is important not only for the individual, but also for the community that is Nigeria, because I believe that it is vital to moving us towards a more equal and peaceful country. Thank you. I am Sabrina, I'm French, and I'm also Tunisian by origin. I grew up in Maurouge. It is in my city that a lady officer was shot dead two years ago during the Charlie Hebdo attack. It is in my street that the terrorist, after the Paris massacre, disposed of an explosive belt right where I lived, right where I played. It is not a far stretch to think that this city is one of these tough ghettos that you see on TV. Well, it is not. It is a fancy municipality, residential, at the fancy gates of Paris. Just with a little bit of diversity. We were a few communities with Turkish backgrounds, Arabic, African, Italian, Portuguese. There was one constant. We were all treated the same, like we did not belong there. You see, the problem is not with diversity. It is never the problem. The problem is with the leadership that rejects diversity and the people who keep voting for these leaders. In France, where I was born and raised, I am still a migrant, une Arabe, une intouchable. When you are not white in France, the famous la vie en rose becomes une vie de merde. Racism in France is so sharp that it cuts. It did cut my life when at 13, I had to flee away from France, a developed country, to Tunisia, a dictatorship, away from racism. I was a happy teenager. I was an odd creature. I did not speak the Arabic really well, and I didn't quite fit, but nobody questioned where I should be there or not. They just took me for Sabrina. A, few, a couple of years later, I decided to give France another shot and go back to my brothers and my dad. 
So I went back to France. One weekend, my parents and I decided to visit Saint-Malo, a jewel of France's west coast. I had moved to this region for my studies, and I was so excited to show off its beauties to my parents. As we were walking down the main street, we stopped for a crêpe, as it is tradition in Brittany. The crêperie staff immediately asked me as I walked in, what do you want? I eagerly answered, une crêpe au Nutella. We don't do that here. Confused, I looked up at the menu board with all the crêpe names on it. Um, okay, any crêpe then. We don't serve them anymore. Okay, what do you serve? Nothing. We are closed. I looked around at the other customers, sitting and eating with their families. They were white. The message was clear. I turned around, only to catch a glimpse of my mother's pink veil as she was walking out the door, head down. That's one weekend. Monday is another story. Tuesday also. We don't get a break. And these stories that chip away at my dignity and at my value never stop. They stay with me. But there's something most people fail to understand, is that these stories are not just about me. They say something about all of us. These stories about, say as much about me than as about the rest of society. Rejection and lack of integration, marginalization, is the main factor that leads to violent extremism. In short, rejecting a kid from society turns the chances against him, but also it turns them against you. The story of the terrorist attacks in France. We all suffered. And these stories are not about a couple of kids gone bad. It is about a society that allowed for years and years of marginalization. It is about the injustice and the, and the inequality every weekend, every Monday, all the way through Friday. It is for the government that allowed for it and pretend not to hear our calls for help from the marginalized communities. It is about the politicians that use the hijab so many times for their electoral and political gains, stomping on the way on the dignity of so many women. Among these women, my mother. The Paris massacre are the result of the social policies that aim at tolerance, thinking that it's anything more than passive rejection. It is proof that it is now time to aim for compassion and empathy in our integration policies. Welcoming migrants and refugees, building honest integration policies, is not about just giving up local resources to help someone who comes from somewhere else. It is a win-win strategy. It is about investing in our future. It is about building unity in our diverse society. So let's drop the electoral gains and drive the attention away from the hijab and the niqab and whatever else veil they they try to grab for the electoral purposes and put the spotlight on how it would help our national productivity if we would solidly condemn racism at the workplace. Wouldn't that help for employment? Let's invite all diverse parts of our society around one table 
one advisory council on diversity and integration policies. Let's create bridges between communities by treating the others like we would like to be treated. Thank you. Remember the evening of 9-11, the day when our world turned upside down. Some segments of society even celebrated the event, ignorant of what it was going to bring upon us. My community on border of Pakistan and Afghanistan couldn't avoid the influence. Afghanistan was attacked. There were two strong sentiments, religion and tribalism. And that's what pushed us as a society to be part of a war that wasn't ours. We were polarized into two major extremes, religion and liberalism. The middle ground of coexistence that kept us together for so long was no more. Intolerance became the order of the day. It even affected deep-rooted friendships and family ties. We were just not ready to listen to each other. To both sides, war was the only solution. In 2008, the conditions even got worse for my family. My younger brother had joined the war. Family fell into constant tension and uncertainty. My parents forgot to smile. I remember I remember how my siblings and I would look for constant excuses to make them smile again. Meanwhile, after my master's, I joined an NGO and started my professional journey. This posed another challenge. NGOs were considered to be the helping end of Western agenda and their employees, Western agents. I was judged constantly. I was compared with my brother from both sides of the conflict. In 2011, after three long years of uncertainty, my brother was shot dead in Afghanistan. But the judgments and comparisons didn't stop. Being both a practicing Muslim and a liberal thinker, I was misfit to both schools of thought. Since 2001, we have lost more than 60,000 innocent lives in Pakistan. 60,000 lives lost to this war of opinions. The peak was even more horrific when a school was attacked and 140 plus innocent children were murdered in cold blood. This was the darkest incident of Pakistan's history. But it also brought the divided segments of the society to a single platform to which I call the middle ground. For the first time, the message was sent across that terrorists belong to no society. They have no religion, no race, and they must be dealt with with an iron fist. Today, 
from Brussels attacks to Ankara's explosion, from Paris massacres to Lahore's blast, we faced the same enemy, we felt the same pain, we suffered alike. Yet the notion of selective humanity prevailed. Global community responded differently to each attack. Again, I realized this polarization of thoughts is a global phenomenon now, and it is growing. The division between religious extreme and liberal majority cannot be overcome by closing borders. It cannot be overcome by passing sweeping laws and shrinking freedoms. It must be discussed and understood. We must collectively strive for that middle ground, the ground of coexistence. I believe with this positive approach, we can reshape the world to a place where diversity will be taken, something that can be cherished. Where masses will not be divided by class, religion, color, or ethnicity, but united by humanity. I believe together we are the solution. Otherwise, the terrorists will keep on exploiting our differences and we will keep on losing our loved ones. Ladies and gentlemen, if their negativity could unite them across the globe, why don't we give chance to our positivity? Thank you so very much. I'm an emergency medicine resident. In my work, I see that time and health are our most precious assets and we often don't appreciate them until they're depleted. I believe that the key to a healthier society is also a more just and equal society. And my interest in health and social justice has taken me from my parents' home in Calgary to the remote Himalayan Spiti Valley, to rural Nicaragua, to Vancouver's downtown east side, to England, and most recently, Montreal. But I stepped outside my clinical training this year because I realized that clinical care, while important, is maybe 20% of what contributes to my patient's health. The other 80% is the health ecosystem. It's the broader social and cultural determinants of health. And I want to share a story that illustrated that for me. I want you to imagine that it's midnight in the emergency room. Joe is your next patient. Everyone knows him because it's his 29th visit this year, and it's only March. What brings you in today, my friend? Hit and run, doc. Need a few stitches. His voice is drawled, and the smell of alcohol hangs on his breath. What have you been drinking this time? Oh, the good stuff. None of that Listerine today, doc. I got 20 bucks from that last driver. Joe earns his living by jumping in front of vehicles outside the emergency room and then offering not to call the police for a price. He always has a smile and a story. So you suture him up, you give him a sandwich, and discharge him. Now imagine your next night shift. The paramedics drive in, sirens blazing, with an unrecognizable trauma victim. Middle-aged, Middle-aged man with hemorrhagic shock, traumatic brain injury, flail chest. The list of injuries continues. What was the mechanism? Hit and run, dragged by a truck for two miles. Do we have an ID? It's Joe. He died that night in our trauma bay. I've been trained for trauma and resuscitation. But stories like Joe's have made me realize that in spite of my training, I'm often ill-equipped to impact my patient's health. Each time we saw Joe, we treated him and then discharged him to the same environment that would inevitably lead to his returning. 
It's why his story haunts me. Because no matter how skilled I am as a clinician, I can't suture poverty, prescribe a home, cast a broken school system, or treat the intergenerational trauma that manifests itself in our emergency room. I work in a system where the ingredients for health are inaccessible for many of our neighbors. And I truly believe that good health is one of the most precious gifts that we have in life. And I think we can all help address the inequalities that contribute to poor health in our own ecosystems, regardless of our field. So how do we do it? We need a new paradigm. We need to apply a health lens in all of our decision making to ask, how does this impact the health of my family, my neighbors, and my community? In the policy world, we can't just think in terms of economic growth and GDP anymore. All policies impact health, and it's the one thing money can never buy or replace. Maayong hapon. Attending classes with an empty stomach and working until 12 midnight to earn for a living? This was me for three straight years while in college. I didn't have an easy life. I come from a poor family. But the only thing that kept me going was the power of education to change my life. And this was what my parents instilled in me since I was young. Determined, I finished college with flying colors. Class valedictorian, magna cum laude, and even one of the 10 outstanding students of the Philippines. I'm proud. My family was proud. My parents told me, you'll finally find a good job and change your and your family's life. However, weeks after my graduation, I still couldn't find a job. I was desperate. I was embarrassed despite my accolades. I couldn't earn to feed my family. But weeks after, an organization hired me as their teacher for children with disabilities coming from poor families. I didn't like the job, as I didn't understand the importance of why we need to educate these children. But I had to take it. I had to earn. I had to feed my family. But as I continued working with children with disabilities, I learned how to love what I was doing. I came to understand that the inclusion of children with disabilities is one of the greatest diversity challenge of our time. I came to believe what Cardinal Roger Malhoney said, that any society is judged on the basis of how it treats its weakest members, the last, the least, the littlest. The whole experience made me empowered and made me realize the people who are at the margins of the society. I felt that feeling of fulfillment and happiness. But three years after I graduated, nothing significant had changed with my family's economic situation. The house had no electricity because my parents couldn't pay the bills. I felt that I had failed my parents especially when they said, Rolando, we're happy and we know that you're happy with what you're doing, but fulfillment doesn't pay the bills. That moment was a game changer. I was at a crossroad. Should I look for good paying jobs or should I continue working with children with disabilities? I have to admit that I was tempted to agree with my parents, but I didn't. I decided to keep on working with children with disabilities and their families at the grassroots and political level. Here's what I did. I took another job. Right after my community work, I'd go straight to the university from 6 p.m. until 12 midnight to work. I also managed to do paid workshops 
and lectures on weekends. But I felt physically exhausted, but I was fulfilled. I was able to send my younger sisters to school. I was able to provide livelihood program for my parents for them to have sustainable income. Up to these days, I continue supporting them in parallel with what I work in the disability sector, this time working as a youth ambassador to the United Nations. I know how challenging it is to choose to pursue one's passion and one's economic stability. But how an individual deals with this dilemma is a matter of choice. If one chooses to try to do both, it requires real strategy. What about using weekends or evenings to earn money in other ways? I am aware that this sounds exhausting, but that's how it works. Building an inclusive and more fair world is never an easy job. Whether you're working on disability issues like me, refugee integration, or gender empowerment, working for social change requires taking risks making tough choices, and putting a lot of hard work. But none of us has or will ever stop me. By being strategic and working really hard, I continue to support my family and to advance the cause I care about. For now, for me, I'm happy and grateful to say, ladies and gentlemen, that fulfillment really does pay the bills. And I believe that it can for you too. Dagang salamat. When I was 25, my plan was to travel the world and save it as I went along. I had just finished working at a large and fancy management consulting firm and I was excited to follow my passion towards a career in international development. I joined a major global NGO, definitely less large and fancy, but still a bit of both. I moved to Berlin, the promised land for young weirdos of all stripes. <laughs> uh, and I settled into a new identity as an international development professional. It really felt like I was living my dream. But within a year of diving into this new life, I was torn. I found myself wondering whether our work was more motivated by what excited our funders and less by what we heard from grassroots communities. I worried that all our good intentions were producing solutions in search of a problem. This was a scary thought for me. And it pushed me to look for more critical perspectives on the work that I was doing. I explored ideas like privilege, neocolonialism, the nonprofit industrial complex, and other phrases that made me equally uncomfortable and that I'd be happy to discuss uncomfortably uh, over fancy cheeses in just a few minutes. <laughs> Within another year, I decided to leave international development. I returned to Canada to serve as director of Head and Hands, a grassroots youth clinic here in Montreal. Another migration across continents, fields of work, and identities. The contrast was huge. For 45 years, this organization had been working in the very same local community, helping young people work through deeply challenging situations from poverty to drug addiction to homelessness. We did this through a, a range of services and programs, all connected by a single core approach. Respect every youth as the person in the best position to define their own problems and to identify the solutions that will work best for them. Coming out of my crisis of conscience around imposing solutions on communities that weren't always asking for them, it's not hard to see why this approach appealed to me so much. Finally, here was a mission that made me want to put down roots but still, within my very first month leading the team, my sense of belonging was put to the test. I felt uncomfortable with some of the ways this approach looked in daily practice. Like, 
Are we really gonna give that 18 year old a box of clean drug injection materials? Even after we saw them throw away the addiction recovery resources we gave them? I asked my team a lot of questions like this and I always got really good answers. For example, research shows that pressuring someone to break an addiction before they're ready, it actually sets them up for failure. Often, it even pushes them to fall back into their addiction harder than before and to be less likely to ask for help in the future. So as I settled more deeply into this work and experienced firsthand the power of the approach, one crucial lesson became clear to me. When we're looking down from positions of privilege, inside systems that have worked well for us, it can be so hard to understand why the solutions that feel so obviously correct to us simply wouldn't work for another person or community with a different experience. Four years later, I'm still deeply involved at Head & Hands, but I'm also back in migration mode, spending a year in this house with 11 amazing other people all trying to figure out our own contributions to a fairer and better world. So how do I keep my future work anchored in the lessons that I learned at Head & Hands? One way is by asking questions. I learned some really powerful ones at Head and & Hands, and I intend to ask them just about wherever I go from now on, especially when it's uncomfortable. I want to make sure I ask about who defined the problem that we're working on? Who designed the solution? Once a project is in motion, who's making decisions about how the work gets done? I wanna ask direct questions about the power of funding to shape decisions on the ground and about whose voices are being given space to balance that out. And if our honest answers to all these questions do not reflect the voices of the people who are supposed to benefit from the work, I want to have the courage to challenge that and to change it before agreeing to move forward. I think more and more, our generation gets how important this is. And I've been inspired to see us holding each other accountable when we slip up. I hope I can be a part of that by taking these questions with me and asking them about everything I'm doing from now on. And really, I think this is something we all need to be doing for each other as young leaders, and also across generations. So, am I nervous about these next steps that, we're all gonna, that I'm gonna take, along with my beautiful housemates here, as we migrate across continents, disciplines, and communities? Mm. Yes, <laughs> I am. But I'm also excited, because I think that we're gonna take giant strides together towards a more fair and equal world, while also keeping our ears close to the ground. Thanks. Thank you.